Honeymoon Island, a barrier island in the Gulf of Mexico near Clearwater, Florida. We see a typical maritime forest going from the high ground to the Gulf. Nature Scene is made possible in part by a grant from Santee Cooper, where protection and improvement of our environment are equal in importance to providing electric energy. And by South Carolina Parks, Recreation and Tourism and the Hilton Head Island Chamber of Commerce, committed to preserving the natural splendor of the Lowcountry. And by viewers like you, members of the ETV Endowment of South Carolina. Welcome to Nature Scene at Honeymoon Island State Recreation Area on the Gulf Coast of Central Florida near Dunedin. I'm Jim Welch with naturalist Rudy Mankey. It's mid-February and what a beautiful sunny day for a walk through a nature area. And a barrier island is such a special place too because of the great variety of habitats here. Lots of barrier islands sadly in Florida have been modified heavily by the hand of man but this one has been protected. And I think we'll have fun today looking at what nature's doing very close to large human populations. You know, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater area is very, very close to this. Tropical species too today are gonna to be interesting to look at. Plants and some animals that don't get any farther north than about right here because of colder weather to the north. And Rudy, this looks tropical right in front Absolutely. of us. It looks very tropical. Common name for this thing, sea grape. Um, it's called that because when it has fruit on it, it looks like grapefruit. But the uh, leaves. That's what's so special about this thing. Kind of leathery, big as you can see. Well, let me reach down and pick one up because this leaf has an interesting story or two attached to it. You can see the mid vein on this leaf, very, very thick and prominent and then veins coming off carrying uh, nutrients out of the leaf. Of course, the leaf when it was green was making food for this plant. But this is so stiff. <laughs> Look at the other side of it here. Very durable looking leaf. Well, people for years used to use this as a postcard. You put a you know stamp up in the corner and write an address on it and turn it over and write a note. You know we're in Florida, wish you were here, and uh, it was passed through the mail without any without any question. But that's an interesting leaf, very very obvious plant even uh, from a distance. Look on this bright green leaf, an anole, same <laughs> color as a leaf. Now if it were on the brown leaf, would it change color? No, not not really. It it has more to do with whether it's in the sunlight or whether it's excited emotionally than it does the uh, the background. But green anole is a good common name for that one. Uh, when it's warm or excited, it does get bright green like that, and then it does turn brown when it's when it's cooler. But uh, that's an insect recycler. I mean, it's here in the sunlight, hoping that insects will come to get the sunlight, and then they get changed into lizard. Honeymoon Island has over 200 species of plants, Rudy. We should have a good day looking at different ones. Yeah, and it's interesting too, some open areas like this, but then you see some pines coming in, slash pine mainly coming in here. We'll see larger stands of that as we walk. And then a rather nondescript shrubby plant, Florida privet is the common name for it. Forestiera is the genus name. But look at those little flowers on that thing. No petals at all, but those are flowers producing nectar and and pollen, very important in reproduction. And you see they're on when really there are very few leaves left on the plant, but the leaves are, uh, are opposite. You can see cabbage palmetto uh, coming up in here, which is a typical species, the state tree of, of Florida. And then off in the distance here now, this is what's so nice. There is the, the, the barrier island look. I mean, piles of sand kicked up by wind and water and then stabilized by, uh, by plants. And geologically, this is a very young yes. piece of land. Yeah, it was 7,000 or so years old is the dates that are put on it. And these plants stabilize that. You can see one plant uh, fairly close to us here in the distance in the sand. 
Uh, beach sunflower is the common name for it, he, one of the helianthus uh, species. And this one is an endemic here. You don't find it anywhere else but in situations like this in, uh, in Florida, and that's a nice one to see. And sea oats out there, again, one of those plants that comes in quickly, stabilizes uh, dunes, even though those dunes aren't very tall. They're dunes nonetheless. And then, of course, Gulf of Mexico in the distance. Osprey Trail and sounds of birds, songbirds all around This us. is great. This is really great. I love the mix of habitats here. Not only the low areas, but a little higher ground. Some bigger trees around us. But look at this open area now. It was a recreation site, we said. So you've opened it up with picnic tables and other things, giving a wonderful ecotone, an edge between an open area and a woods. And look what's wandering right in front of us. The armadillo. <laughs> Isn't that a wow. great animal? That's really an interesting one with the little arbor plating on it. That's the nine-banded armadillo. If you count those bands in the center, there would be nine in number. And a mammal. Doesn't even seem to mind that we're here. Ears up, so you know, listening. And just poking his nose in the ground looking for something to eat. What kind of food do you suppose he's looking for? I imagine invertebrates there. Uh, lots of insects, mole crickets and other crickets uh, that are in the, uh, in the grass. Sticks his nose down there, real good sense of smell, and has claws on the front legs that are great for digging, and the hind legs too, but that's a neat little edible. Well, besides the plating, would he have hair? It looks like hair on yeah, him as well. It's a mammal, and you can see a lot of hair, uh, especially on those back legs, almost like chaps on the back legs there. But it is a mammal, feeds its young uh, milk, and when it reproduces, has always identical quadruplets, four same sex and genetically absolutely the same, which is an odd thing for a mammal but typical of the uh, armadillo. Rudy, look at the great egret, and it doesn't seem afraid of us at all. Standing still, I really didn't even notice it, and look how brightly white it is, <laughs> standing there like a statue. And although you have breeding plumage on the back, hanging down, that's a beautiful bird any time of the year, but especially when it's in breeding plumage. Dark legs, too, on that thing. And you see what looks almost like the, uh, the knee joint there, that's really the ankle <laughs> sticking up there. So. Bones are elongated, and that gives the bird its, its great height. Slender neck, and then that yellow stiletto-like beak on it. Edges are wonderful places well, it, to observe. It's a perfect place to look for food, too. See, that's the other thing. I bet you, now that's a wading bird. I see no water close. Probably out there looking for large insects, or maybe even lizards, to, to change into, into great egret. That's an interesting animal. And then flowers, you expect nectar to be available in flowers, and there are the flowers that are popping out there. Spanish needle is one of the common names for it. What kind of butterflies that are coming? To well, the white one is the great southern white, coming very, very quickly, and that's, you know, the flower is a composite, so there's lots of nectar, and you just stick your proboscis, your tongue, from flower to flower to flower to flower. Doesn't stay long at any one group of flowers, but, uh, but there it goes. Nice Gulf Fritillary right on the ground, Jim. Look at the color on that uh, animal. Really freshly out, too. I don't even think there's a scale missing. Orange on the wings, a little bit of uh, dark markings, and then that silver on the top of the uh, front wings are nice. Larval food plant for that is passion flower, one of the vines that's so common in areas like this, but flat against the ground, I guess, warming up a little bit in the uh, sunshine. And live about two weeks as an adult, so this animal has to well, warm up and get started pretty quickly. Oh my goodness. Now here is a snake that I don't see a lot. It's pretty widespread, the range is, but I don't see an eastern coach whip very often. Dark on the front, big eye that you can see on the body there, which is nice. And then most of the body is sort of a brownish or a ivory color. Big scales, smooth scales, no ridge at all on the scales. Fastest moving of all the snakes probably that we've got. But it looks like it's just freshly shed and warming up just a little bit in the sun, right on the edge of the woods there. Slash pines a little bit bigger here. And look at this. Look at the osprey right up in the tree here with a fish in its talons <laughs> feeding on it right above us. Pretty nonchalant, too. Right at the head of Osprey Trail. <laughs> Makes sense. At this angle, I've never seen an osprey from the underside like this, but leaning forward. And you can see the way the talons are gripping the bird so nicely. And then the curved beak and just taking the front end of that fish and tearing it into pieces. And changing it into bird. It's amazing the way that works.
majority of these taller trees, of course, are slash pine, mm -hmm. and this is virgin slash pine, but I guess they don't get a whole lot bigger than some of these. Now, these are some nice-sized trees, really a different feeling uh, along the uh, forest trail, too. And if you're tall trees, you got vines going up the side, and the one with the red fruit there is an odd one. It's a non-native plant. Gosh, there's so many introductions in this part of Florida. Rosary pea is one name for it. Uh, crab's eyes is another one. Named after the fruit. See the uh, little capsules with the seed inside? Bright red. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Extremely poisonous if eaten. Interesting to look at, but very, very poisonous if ingested. Uh, compound leaves on that vine, too. But one of the many introductions that in a part of the world where it's plenty of moisture and lots of warm temperatures, it takes off. Now, thinking of poisons, look at uh, poison ivy. That's one thing I've noticed, really, as we were walking. I mean, there's poison ivy coming up on both sides of the trail. Um, three leaflets. Leaflets, three, let it be. And then look at the color of the fruit on it. White mm -hmm. fruit. And uh, that lets you know poison ivy with that combination. Very, very common right along the side. Another plant right here. We saw cabbage palmetto earlier. This is saw palmetto close to us. And if you look on the petiole, uh, the stem of the leaf, it does have a saw-like edge on it. And when you think of slash pines, you think of saw palmettos in this part of the world. That's an, uh, a normal combination of things. Pretty look at the great blue heron up in the tree and it's strange behavior. Yeah, it's preening, but now it's leaning back a little bit more and uh, see the way it spreads the tail feathers and rubs against something there? That's an oil gland. Gets a little bit of oil on the feathers and then it can spread it you know, all over the body and, and keep uh, water from wedging its way in between the feathers. That bird is at home high up in a tree like that, and it's amazing with those gangly legs that it can do it. And they nest up there, of course. And you got your binoculars, mm -hmm. red-bellied woodpecker, to the other side over there, a little higher up, working on the edge, sort of tapping into the bark, ladder back look on the back, and, you know, and then red all over the top of the exactly. head. Exactly, it has the red head, and yet yeah. it, the name comes from the blush on the belly. Yeah, and it is a male because that red goes all the way down the, uh, the back of the head there. Uh, that's an interesting bird up high. Look at that little southern black racer now, up on the vines, right in the sunlight, shiny body, of course related to that coach whip that we saw a few moments ago. Uh, but this is a nice snake, interesting snake, because again, no ridges on the scales. Not as large a scales as you saw on the coach whip, but moving there a little bit, yawning a little bit, tongue coming out, you can see it flickering, forked on the end to pick up odor particles out of the air. Doesn't seem to mind us being here either. Well, that's a nice animal. The trail takes us through some 80 acres of different habitats. This one more sandy. What? Actually, would you call this type? Really, habitat? almost a sand ridge situation. You see, the plants are beginning to change all around us, and when you're dry and open, of course, cactus plants come in a lot. But the plant that dominates right here, I love this one. It's really a juniper, but we always call it a cedar. Southern red cedar would be the common name for this. Healthy old tree. Oh yeah, that's a magnificent tree. And then there are other things around it that are nice. Snowberry is one of the common names for this. Uh, shrub that's got snowy white fruit on it, berry-like fruit, so that's a pretty good common name for it. Is it edible? Uh, that's not one that humans eat. A lot of other animals take advantage of it. And it's one of those tropical species, you know, that doesn't get a whole lot farther north. The southern red cedar now goes a great deal farther uh, north. Here's another one with a great name. Now just look at the fruit on it first. Looks like a necklace, looks like beads on a necklace. So necklace pod is the, the common name for that plant. <laughs> And it's in the pea family or bean family, obviously. Not only does the fruit say that, look at the flowers, a few uh, yellow flowers on. And also, as you see, compound uh, leaf, which uh, is true of a lot of members of the, of the pea family. Rudy, what's going on over here with the, something flying out of that dead branch? Oh my goodness, those are termite reproductives coming out of the dead branch. And look at the, look at the uh, lizard now, not the green anole, but the brown anole. That'll never be green. That's an introduction. And he's just taking those termite reproductives, boom, 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 and lapping them up. Look at the inside of his mouth, even. That's nice. Will he threaten the animal as far as habitat? Uh, yes. This one has taken the space away from, from the native species. That's what happens a lot when non-native animals and plants are, are brought in. 
Now, we mentioned uh, cactus. Uh, Opuntia is certainly the genus name here. I'm not absolutely sure of the species, but you would call it prickly pear for sure. And the fruit on it, uh, people used to make jellies and jams out of that. You can see that's very, very um, clear there. And another plant here with stickers. You know the cactus has stickers, but look at what's called toothache tree. My grandmother always called that. Uh, a lot of people of her generation used it to deaden gums that were bothered. Prickly ash is a name for it. Hercules Club is another name for that plant. And you see stickers on the stem and also stickers would be on the leaves and even early flowers beginning to develop on that. And again, spines like that protect you when you're in an exposed area like this. Open areas like this allow for easier movement for gopher tortoises and I don't see the, the tortoise, but look at the burrow there. That's an active one for sure. And they're out here, vegetarians taking advantage of opportunities. Pretty big turtle you can tell by the size of the uh, of the burrow and all kinds of animals live down there with that turtle. Without the trail it would be almost impossible to get through this heavy understory of the cell phone meadow, and what are the other shrubs really all about us? Well, there are two of them that really dominate in here. One of them, uh, real common right here, wax myrtle is the common name for it. You can see the, the fruit on it. If you crushed it, it's kind of waxy uh, feeling, used to scent candles sometimes. And lots of birds, really warblers and woodpeckers, will come down and, and uh, eat that fruit. And then the other one is, uh, scientific name is baccarus. Uh, salt bush is one common name for it. Puts up with salt spray in the air, and of course every plant here has to put up with a little bit of salt spray in the air, but uh, that's, a, that's a pretty hardy plant in situations like this. And then the slash pines around us, some of them really large, and one of them, look at this, look at the nest up there with a great horned owl sitting right in the top. Oh, and well, not only that, a little <laughs> fluff Is that a little, baby, yeah. a little fuss ball down there. Wow. Look at over the edge. Huh. Yeah, they nest this time of year, really, of course, start earlier than this and lay eggs, and then the uh, eggs develop into young. They're, they're hunting more at night, but sitting on the nest in the daytime. And you see why it's called a great horned owl. I mean, it is a big one. And then those feathers look like horns on the top of the head. And the wind's blowing a little bit up in that higher tree. Look at the way it moves those tail feathers, too. Excellent at hearing, I guess. Oh, yeah. And a powerful bird. I mean, the talons on that bird are very, very sharp, very strong. And uh, takes all sorts of animals and changes them into, into owl. That's and that's the largest owl in this part of the world. That is a special treat. Now, all around us, of course, we can see nests. Well, there are osprey all over the place, and uh, you, you don't even have to look very far. Usually in dead trees, I wouldn't Im imagine exclusively, but usually in dead trees you see the stack of, of uh, branches, and that's a nest they add on to year after year after year after year. wonder how many nesting pairs are here, but that makes this a special place. Just look, it just sort of move from one side to the other. There are all sorts of nests and birds everywhere you look. And you were mentioning now that shrubs are right here. One of the nice things that people do here is manage with fire as a tool. And the management team was in the other day and, and did a little bit of burning to get rid of the excess fuel on the ground so there wouldn't be one really big fire. There are lots of small ones. And that opens up the world and allows a lot of the plants and animals that are living here to survive. In the old days, lightning would have started all of those fires. Rudy, we've seen a lot of natural areas across the country, been in a lot of habitats, but not so many mangrove-type swamp situations. And whenever you see mangroves, you think of you know tropical, subtropical climates. They don't do well in, in cold weather at all. They're in central Florida and south, don't get much farther north. The two that are in here that really dominate, white uh, mangrove is the one with the thick-looking leaves. You see the leaves are opposite and very, very sturdy and thick if you were to touch them. Doesn't have any prop roots or any growths from the base like some mangroves. And then the other one over here, black mangrove, and you look at the leaf, it's a different color. Really, it's more green, not really as thick either. But if you look underneath those trees, you'll see the little uh, pneumatophores, they're called, the modified roots that stick up, probably involved in gas exchange, but that's typical of uh, black mangroves. And then the other one in here that Looks like a mangrove in lots of ways and yet is different. Buttonwood is the common name for it. 
named after the fruit that you see is hanging down there, looks like brown, you know, buttons, mm -hmm. makes pretty good sense. All of these have to put up with salt water, and you either exclude salt, never pick it up, or you pick it up and have to excrete it. And a lot of times on the leaves, especially of the black mangrove, if you touch it with your tongue, it's salty tasting. Salt is excreted there. And you'd expect these trees along the southern Florida coast. This is exactly where they're supposed to be. And same is true, look at the little animals that are doing a little bit of moving in front of us in that sunny area there. Crabs? Fiddler crabs, oh, really? good common name. And look at the modified claw on the male there that looks like he's holding a fiddle, so the, uh, the common name. And you can see him not only with the big claw there, see the smaller one picking up food, it looks like? Boom, 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 boom. Hmm. And you can see holes over here where I don't see animals with the little round balls of sand that they've you know, brought to the surface as they make the hole uh, deeper. They just kind of roll them up and dump them out. So what do they feed on, Rudy? They feed on, on detritus mainly, which is just organic material that's, that's loose in the sand. And of course, when the ocean comes in here and floods it, it brings in lots of organic debris. And of course, they get fed upon by raccoons especially. I bet if you came back at night, raccoons would be walking right along this trail. We've had about a two-mile walk up through the trail to the northern end here, and it gives us another different look at the recreation area. I love it. I love the variety, and it's close at hand. Nice little tidal areas here. As the tide goes out, they're exposed, and birds and other animals take advantage of those opportunities. Tidal flats like that are so nice. Look at all the cormorants way over there. whole line of them. That is the most cormorants I've ever seen in one place. And you figure shallow water like this, that's a perfect place to, to look for food. Now, they're looking for food in one way. Look at the black skimmers up there. Looking for food in a totally different way. An odd looking oh, bird, that's isn't it? Well, really black on the back too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it always looks like it's so heavy in the front because of that big uh, beak. And the lower one longer than the upper one. High hidden sort of in the black. Yeah, it's it? hard to see, it really is. And then really when they turn around just right, you know, that beak is, is much more narrow than it looks from the side. But the black and the orange there is, is nice. That is really an interesting bird. Crowded together, and they'll be fishing in these shallows probably pretty soon. A couple of laughing gulls down there too, bumping into each other on the beach. This is the right season of the year to be bumping into each other if your bird's mating season is coming. And what's this other, there are a couple of... Uh... Willets, I guess, longer legs. Yeah, will, willets walking around, uh-huh. Beak nicely uh, adjusted to grabbing invertebrates out of the sand, out of the shallow water here, and long legs. And then when you got a little bit of debris in the water, and oysters come and attach to it, sort of an oyster bed formation, American oyster catcher is exactly what you would expect to be here, and there it is. And the orange beak, and very pliable beak, really, for the most part. And is it specialized in terms of the beak's use? Yeah, going in for those bivalves, you know, pecking down there, poking or probing or whatever, uh, trying to get something loose and then swallow it down. That's a beautiful bird. <laughs> that really is nice. And what are the tiny birds we see close by on the, on the rocks? One of them there is the uh, semi-palmated uh, plover. And that is a bird that spends the winter here and then goes to the Arctic regions of the world to nest. So it's here for just a while and then spends uh, the breeding season way, way north. So that's got a long way to fly. I see a least sandpiper uh, moving by there too. See slow and steady with kind of greenish legs? Talk about even smaller oh. yet. And that one's got a long way to fly, as does the ruddy turnstone. You can see them there, little orange legs on them. All three of those birds are here now and then head much farther north to, uh, to breed. What a great day this has been. What a wonderful place to visit with so many birds to look at and so many osprey. Yeah, I've never seen more osprey in one place that, that we've seen here at Honeymoon Island. And it's interesting being so t close to Tampa and St. Petersburg and Clearwater, you know, really to have a special place like this protected, well, it's something that doesn't happen without a lot of people pitching in. Thank goodness they were far-sighted enough to protect it. Honeymoon Island State Recreation Area, Central Florida on the Gulf. Thanks for watching and join us again on the next Nature Scene.
a production of South Carolina ETV. Nature Scene is made possible in part by a grant from Santee Cooper, where protection and improvement of our environment are equal in importance to providing electric energy. And by South Carolina Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, and the Hilton Head Island Chamber of Commerce, committed to preserving the natural splendor of the Lowcountry. And by viewers like you, members of the ETV Endowment of South Carolina. If you enjoyed this edition of Nature Scene, you may order it or any of the earlier programs in the series by calling 1 800 553 7752 or send your request to the address on the screen. Each video is priced at $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Major credit cards are accepted. A brochure listing all Nature Scene programs of field trips in the natural areas of North America will be included with each order. Hi, this is Rudy Mankey inviting you to join me and Jim Welch as Nature Scene visits Honeymoon Island State Park on the Gulf Coast of Florida near the Tampa St. Petersburg Clearwater area. Interesting island, lots and lots of osprey, a couple of snakes along the way, interesting wildflowers. We start on high ground, work our way all the way down to the water. That's next time on Nature Scene.